Welcome to the Floyd Zakovich University of Wollongong uh, Q&A session. I'm going to hand over to Luke and Aidan who are going to introduce themselves, uh, talk to you about their legal pathways, their careers, and then we'll lead into a Q&A session where you guys can ask your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Luke. Floyd Zadkiewicz, International Commercial Lawyers. Thank you, Shannon. Um, good to be here. Uh, I know uh, Aidan and I are, are very excited to be speaking with uh, some University of Wollongong uh, students. We're both alumni ourselves and, and very proud of um, having gone to Wollongong. Uh, for a bit of background, I am uh, a local you know, a local lad. I went to uh, Winuna Primary, uh, Winuna High School, and then on to uh, the University of Wollongong, uh, so, and, and grew up pretty much all, the whole time you know, in the area. Uh, after, well, during university, actually, I was um, I was living in in Sydney for a while and working up there as a paralegal, uh, and split my time between Sydney and Wollongong, uh, and then worked for a few different Sydney firms um, uh, upon admission I was at HWL Ebsworth uh, for a few years and then moved from there in a Sydney office moved from there over to London um, uh, at the start of 2008 so what's that about 12 13 years ago now uh, spent seven odd years in London then went over to New York I was in New York for five years um, and now I'm, I'm splitting my time between between London and New York and in that process learned a few things along the way uh, and uh, we set up our firm uh, Ed Floyd and the other founding partner and myself three years ago we've just had our three-year birthday uh, last month uh, I can't believe it's already July but there we are um, and we we thought that um, we would run these Q&A sessions that we're, we're calling them with students around the world we've done uh, done a couple with uh, a high school and some some other universities in the US uh, and both Aidan and I wanted to reach out and speak with uh, some Wollongong students and just really offer, offer provide the platform and offer the opportunity for you to to ask questions you know particularly at this time I can imagine with all all the troubles there are at the moment um, and uncertainty with job prospects and uh, and the news that's uh, that we're bombarded with that as a student coming through you might naturally be thinking well where do i stand what does that mean for me um should i be thinking about things differently uh and, and this and that and it was with that in mind that we thought actually students may be a kind of cohort of, of people that might have a lot of questions at the moment uh, and and so it, it really is um, an open open discussion uh, ask whatever you want uh, about you know it, anything really and uh, hopefully we can we can provide um, some assistance uh, so Aidan do you want to say a couple of words just to introduce yeah. yourself yeah thanks Luke um, so I grew up in Bulai um, it's right next door to Winuna went to Bulai High, um, then came across to UOW. Um, I, fin I graduated in 2018, so 2018 was my last year. Um, and from there, I was an associate in the district court um, to a judge there. So I learned lots of, diff I mean, different stuff about civil and crime, um, which was a really good eye opener for me just to see both areas of law. Um, but I came to be really interested in more of the international legal issues, such as like conflict of laws, what jurisdiction to bring different actions in. Um, and then funnily enough, I spoke to Luann Freeman, um, who works in the School of Law office. And she happened to mention that Luke had opened up a firm um, in New York and London. And when she said, oh, he's a really nice bloke, you should send him a cover letter. I was like, okay, I'll send him a cover letter. Um, and from there, it all picked up and I ended up writing a journal article with Luke and Ed um, and then started at Floyd's ad in January. 
And so we're, we're delighted that Aiden's on board. It's worked out really well. We, we started working, as, as Aiden said, on, on the, um, the journal, journal article. And, and from there, it uh, turned into, um, into a position. And uh, yeah, very excited to, to have him on board. And we're looking at ways of um, uh, furthering the relationship with the university as well. Um, we've got a, a virtual work experience um, program coming up. Um, which uh, Shannon can tell you a little bit more about uh, at the end of this session. Um, and yeah, so we, we're, we're looking at this as kind of an ongoing um, situation where we can uh, help you guys try and get into the, into the market um, uh, or, or just, you know, provide some guidance. It doesn't mean you have to go into a law firm. You may, you may have other ideas of moving into different parts of the sector or not into law at all. Um, I, I know with the, the, uh, student friends that I had that I went through, they've gone in all sorts of different directions now. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyone like to open up um, and, and pose a question? If you'd like to just speak, that would work. Yeah, you can just raise your hands because I can actually see you because there's not... There's yeah, no... okay. Um, yeah, go for well, it. Well, like, this is sort of the first opportunity I've ever had to speak with, you know, a firm that's just recently been founded. So my question would be, what sparked the desire to start an entirely new firm for you guys? Because I understand there's, you know, loads of competition in, you know, not only your area of law, but, you know, all the other ones as well. So was there any key decision behind starting a whole new firm for you guys? Or Yeah, good, very good question. Um, look, from a personal perspective, there's a, a few facets to this. From a personal perspective, I've always been interested in, um, uh, creating something, um, uh, whether you call it entrepreneurial spirit or, um, you know, leadership or whatever it is, but I, I've wanted to kind of create a team and, uh, 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 something new and fresh. It took a long time for me to get around to actually, um, uh, moving forward on that. And I think that entrepreneurial spirit was uh, fostered in different ways when I was in big firms. I only ever worked in big firms prior to um, setting up our, um, our outfit. And so there was this kind of personal interest in doing something like that. And then more from a business perspective, it was really identifying a gap in the market and, and where we could um, set up an offering uh, providing uh, top level services as, as you would get at the, the large firms that I was at previously, but with a point of difference. And that point of difference was that Ed, as I said, the founding partner um, was a New York uh, attorney, is a New York attorney also qualified in, in New Jersey and does work all over the US. And I'm primarily an English solicitor or spent most of my time as an English solicitor, also uh, qualified in New York as well um, and, and New South Wales. So, we got together and started um, uh, kicking around some ideas. I'd known Ed for many years when I was in London working with him on the US side of different cases. And uh, it, it, as those discussions uh, developed, it became quite clear to us that there was a real um, market for a combined outfit that did both US and English services in one team, one boutique, uh, not in different profit centers that you will find in, in the bigger firms where we work seamlessly together. And so when we're dealing with a, a US case, I bring to bear the English perspective uh, and, and vice versa. And even though one system uh, is derivative of the other or, you know, they, they heavily draw upon similar principles, they do look at different legal issues differently. Um, and so that, that has, really added to the depth of um, the solution that we provide. Practically speaking, there are a number of cases, particularly in the maritime and commodity space that involve both jurisdictions. So you might have something playing out in the US, it could be getting security or it could be looking to enforce a claim um, and that's in the US and the underlying contract, the contractual issue that you're dealing with is subject to English law, English um, arbitration say. And so you can be handling at one time simultaneously action in both jurisdictions. And from a client's perspective, that's a real cost saving 
because rather than having to brief, brief two sets of lawyers, they've got one, one team that's working together um, and not having to, to rebrief on both sides and, and in effect developing the strategy uh, in tandem. So there's, there's a very much a personal side to it and, and also a business, um, business dimension. And now having, you know, um, grown the firm from starting just two guys to where we are today with a team of about 10 uh, and growing, um, it's, it's a really great feeling to look back and say, wow, in three years, we've got um, some really star people working with us, you know, like Aidan, like Shannon, like the other partners who have joined the team. And um, there's a real uh, buzz to that, to be honest, uh, having, a, having a team working around you. Okay, anyone else? Any other questions we got here? Uh, if we go Brianna first, if that helps, sorry. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering how focused during your law degrees were you on the international realm within law um, and whether that was something that you found necessary to branching into international law or if it's something you fell into afterwards? Yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting you ask that because at university, I always had an inclination or a yearning to do international work. Um, that was quite strong for me. I, th I think I wrote my dissertation on international human rights law actually going back. And I always had some international dimension, some interest in, in what I was doing. I didn't though, during my studies, really hone in on that, um, uh, quite frankly. I, I didn't set about doing international maritime law to get into a maritime law um, law firm or, or even international commercial or I did some subjects but it wasn't wasn't the focus it was more the the latter of those two scenarios kind of falling into it in a way um, I worked my way through you know I suppose I could say um, I started as a paralegal quite early on second year of uni I did a double degree started off science and law um, the science lasted for for six months before I flipped over to a BA and politics major, um, too much cutting up of frogs and what have you for my liking. I'm sure it would have gotten quite interesting on more the, the um, policy side, which was the original intention. But anyway, I ended up doing politics and law five years. And for in the second year, I started working as a paralegal and that was in Sydney. So I was living in Wollongong at that stage, commuting up to Sydney, getting experience, doing a couple of days of work a week and then kind of putting all my subjects onto a few days to the extent that I could at, at, at uni. I also um, did a lot of summer subjects and um, intensive subjects as I went through because I wasn't technically maintaining a full-time workload during normal semester. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I worked in I worked for a firm that did a lot of uh, teachers work initially. So uh, helping teachers with all sorts of issues Then I moved into an insurance law firm, uh, Hunt and Hunt, and I was handling workers' compensation, personal injury, that type of uh, insurance work. From there, uh, I then moved on upon qualification, I moved to um, Ebsworth and Ebsworth as they were then um, now HWL Ebsworth. And from there moved into, so in that role, I was doing um, kind of top end insurance work, DNO, uh, directors and officers, liability cases, financial institutions, insurance work, um, and all manner of professional indemnity cases, you know, acting for, uh, for the insurers, but on cases involving financial planners, solicitors, things like that. And got to two and a half years out of, um, out of university, uh, ad working as an admitted um, legal practitioner and wanted to travel. And I'd always had the idea to travel. Back then, there was a requirement of doing two years of um, admitted service first in your home jurisdiction to be able to cross qualify into England. Uh, and I had actively looked into moving to, to London directly after uni and uh, was told, well, you would be able to get a position, but it would be more of a paralegal position. You really should, if you can, do two years first and then move. That was just the requirements at that time. I know it's changed now. 
Um, and so I did that. And, but I, I always had this interest in going over that. As for the job that I landed in, that was circumstance, honestly. I got, got on really well with my, my old mentor um, at the firm that I worked at. Uh, he was an English guy, moved to Australia, married uh, an Australian woman and, and set up and never went back, stayed in Australia uh, for all his career. And uh, he had some good contacts in, in London um, and wanted to encourage me to, to go and you know, pursue my dreams and what have you. Really good guy. And set me up with a few interviews. I had a few interviews lined up uh, on my own accord. And... Um, I think three or four of those were with insurance law firms and one of them was with uh, Holman Fennick Willen as they um, were then known or oh, Holman Fennick and Willen they dropped the ampersand at one point uh, and now they're HFW and that was the kind of for me at that time the left field option it was in maritime and commodities I was sitting in a, a group called trade and energy really not knowing much about um, that sector and that type of work at all um, and was offered a position um, and, and had a decision to make. Do I go down the insurance route or do I go into this other area that I don't really know much about, but it is international in, uh, in um, substance. And I was determined that I was just going to go for a couple of years and come back to Australia. And this was just going to be like a trip, trip overseas. Uh, <laughs> Although my mum's not entirely impressed about it. Um, I'm still, still abroad, what is it, 12, 13 years later. And yeah, so then landed in that role and it just took off. I really enjoyed it. it it's, um, it's a fascinating area of law because by its very nature, it is international. Uh, it, you can't get away from it. it it's, I think, probably... Um, one of the the areas that's that's most international in the way that it, it operates because you've got ship owners and um, commodity traders or other other chartering companies um, that are based all over the world their assets are all over the world the companies and shell companies that they set up to hold the assets are all over the world they regularly will want to um, contract on the basis of English law or US law because it will be an independent um, or maybe an independent um, jurisdiction governing law for the two parties. They don't, if you've got an Indian trader and a, uh, an Italian trader, they don't want to have the dispute decided in Italy or in India. They choose somewhere neutral. So they go for, for England, let's say. And yeah, it's, as I say, it's, it's, it, so it is international in its dimension. And, and on top of that, you've got um, layers to it. So it's not just, the the law itself or the governing law of the contract issue or the you know the tort based issue you're dealing with but you've then got this enforcement and security level that sits above it so you've kind of got, got jurisdiction as an issue which is international often you've got the governing law which is another international issue you've then got different um ways of handling that issue depending on what governing law has been incorporated but then you have this um other element which you just don't tend to think of in domestic litigation and that is security and enforcement and so if you have an arbitration award from london where you've got an english arbitrator who has decided to issue an award um, in your favor you've then got to just using the example before you've then got to take that english award and have it recognized in india or italy depending on whoever was successful so You've got to understand how that works. And that's another dimension to the, to the practice that makes it really interesting. Aidan, did you have anything to add on, on that? Um, so I, when I first started at UOW, um, I didn't really know anything about international law. Um, and then I did a stint at Oxford for six months. Um, and there, I really came to understand, particularly in England, that there are jurisdictional and international issues um, a lot more, and particularly over there because of, they have the Human Rights Act um, and the European Union. So there I really got to understand that there are really interesting international issues um, that I hadn't necessarily thought of before. Um, then I came back to UOW to continue my degree 
but didn't necessarily do any international law um, or anything like that. Um, but I, I was a research assistant to Professor Greg Rose, um, and he did a lot of more human rights, international law of the sea. Um, so I could, kind of came across a bit of maritime there, which sparked my interest a bit. Um, but it wasn't until I got to the district court that it again became another issue, um, as a lot of people tried it, were enforcing in Australia, but enforcing judgments um, from other countries, um, which I thought was again really interesting. And then that's how it kind of sparked my interest. And I, that's where I decided to go with Floyd Zadkovich. Yeah. And the, the, the other point I would make is um, thinking practically about it now. Um, if I, uh, if I had had the cause or, or the mindset that I, I wanted to get into a particular area of law um, or move abroad or, you know, explore it, I would have done more of it at university. I, I took a certain path um, and went down more of a working path that was in part out of necessity. I needed to pay my way through uni. Um, and I didn't know anything about law at all. I, my, my parents were uh, teachers um, and I didn't have any law in, in my family. I was, I was the first lawyer uh, in my extended family. And so being a paralegal was a good way to get a taste of what the law is, let alone international law. And so that's the route I went. If I was, um, if I was in your shoes and perhaps, you know, came to the idea that I wanted to do international work earlier on, then I would certainly look into that. I would look at doing a, an exchange if you can, uh, maybe studying abroad, getting involved in, the, in kind of the program that we're, we're running, um, start to follow. Uh, if it's private practice, you want to go, go down, start to follow um, different firms out there. Um, there's obviously the, the biggest firms um, to, to look at, but you, you might actually find that if you drill down below that in the niche that you're interested in, uh, sometimes the mid-level boutiques, they're, they're doing interesting things and there, there can be ways to get involved with those firms. And if you demonstrate an interest and just write to them, frankly, you know, find, uh, find someone or look at a case. I think one thing I would do is if, if I'd identified a firm that I was interested in um, and they're practicing their you know, leaders in, in an area of law or they seem approachable. I like what the content they're producing on LinkedIn. I've followed them for a while. Um, uh, I then pick up that they, um, they've been involved in, in an interesting case. Uh, I would, um, I would on the back of a press release that they've issued talking about some big win they've had on a case uh, or, a, or a loss, I suppose, um, and uh, write to maybe the senior associate or, or the partner, but write to the senior associate saying, look, I'm a, I'm a student from uh, Wollongong, Australia. I'm really interested in, in your area of law. I've been following what your firm's been doing for a while. I see you had this great result on this case. Um, did I'm, I'm looking and trying to explore ways to uh, generate relationships with um, with firms with a view to um, maybe uh, you know, future job prospects or whatever it is. Um, can we, you know, can we have 15 minutes, half an hour to, to talk through that case? I'd, I'd be interested to, to learn more about it and just start the relationship, generate the relationship. Now, some people might ignore that. I I'd, I'd think most people would probably respond to it. Um, honestly. Uh, and you just start from there. And that's not to say that's going to lead to a job necessarily at that firm, but it will start a conversation. And you, if you do that a few times, uh, you might start to get traction. They'll probably say something like, well, you know, it's been great talking to you, really enjoyed the conversation. I'll put you in touch with our HR. We have a, a summer program that, you know, apply for that. Or, um, you know, or if they don't, if they're a smaller firm, they might not have a formal program. And you say, can I, can I arrange if I, if I can get myself over to London for a month, can I come and well, maybe not right at the moment with COVID, but <laughs> next year, perhaps can I, can I come and have a month um, in your office and set up a, an experience? I know the university also has programs. Uh, we've been chatting with John Literich about that. 
um, which we'll be supporting as well. So the, I, I'd, I'd be exploring all those things. If you've got a real interest in it, why not? Okay, hope that answered your question. Um, I think Lucy had one next. Um, so if you want to go ahead and ask that, Lucy. Yes, I actually had two questions, but my second question kind of flows on for the, um, from the point that was just made. Um, I've noticed that a lot of the members of your firm have um, completed postgraduate studies, so masters or, or things of that nature. I'm wondering if you think that it's beneficial to prioritise those sort of studies early in the career, or if there's no real benefit of, of doing it early. Um. Oh, look, I think there's there's definitely benefit in doing um, master's programs. I think there's a lot to be said for it. It can demonstrate an interest in an area. You can you can do them because you you want to have a, a, a more solid grounding in an area before getting in, into into work. I don't think they're necessary. Um, I, if if I was thinking about trying to get into, I'll just use our area, one of our areas for example. If I was trying to get into maritime law. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say you have to go and do a, you know, a master's at Tulane or Southampton or what have you in, in maritime law to get a job. Um, we do often you know, look at candidates from, from those types of schools. But if you can land a job uh, and you're, you show that interest through other ways, maybe writing a dissertation on maritime law or, um, as, I, as I was saying before, generating some relationships with a maritime law firm, and you land the job then i don't think it's necessary one to have done a master's to be able to um, start in that area or to to get that role you may wish to do it at some point uh, and there are there's obviously the full master's programs and there are other um, specialist programs you can do as well which are perhaps more conducive to doing um, in parallel with an actual job but if I'm getting to, if, if I'm really interested in an area of law and I'm getting to you know, six months out and I haven't got something lined up or a year out, whatever the, the admission date is, I, I would be doing something like that. Um, so if, if you made your decision, you know what, I really want to do maritime law. Um, I'm not getting the traction that I, I like. Maybe it's simply because um, uh, of the, the current situation. Uh, there's a pandemic on and I want to get that extra year and hope the market is more buoyant when I'm then looking again, as well as having demonstrated an interest. And, and the other really good thing about um, the maritime courses that those programs do and others, there's, there are, Swansea does one there in, in um, Wales. There are a number of others around the world that do them. There may be, there may be one in Singapore, actually, a bit closer, closer to home for you guys. Uh, but the, what I was going to say is one really good thing as well as the substance is the people you meet. And a lot of these courses have, um, uh, candidates, students from, and even qualified lawyers from all over the world coming to do their one year at Tulane or Southampton. And that is a great way to have an early network in an area of law. Um, you will find then that those people pop up in different places, whether it's at a client or other um, contacts, other lawyers uh, throughout your, your career thereafter. So they can be really good things to do, particularly in an international area of law, like the one, um, that, uh, one of the ones that we practice in. Thank you. Um, I do have another question, but I am conscious that I'm no, go taking for it. the time. So if someone go else had another one and wanted to jump in. Um, so you mentioned how tightly the um, UK and US teams work together um, within the firm. I'm just wondering if you could um, elaborate on any specific difficulties that you find in having two teams in maybe different time zones and, and definitely in different states. Um. You know, uh, there are practical difficulties, I suppose. Um, uh, you know, it'd be great if we were all sitting in, in, in one office, in one place. Um, but even before, before the, the lockdown and we we're all working from home locations, uh, we, we operated from a number of different places and jurisdictions. And, and we just set, set up our firm 
in a way that everyone had to be or has to be um, au fait with using technology. Um, we were already not virtual. We had we have actual locations where we go, you know, to the office. But I'm traveling regularly. We used to travel a lot, not so much at the moment. Um, and I. I would be visiting clients all over the world or taking witness statements. We had depositions in Greece just prior to the lockdown um, for, for US work. Uh, so constantly traveling and others in the team are as well. And because we're always on the go, we've got to be able to communicate effectively uh, through electronic means. So we had all the systems set up uh, working out of the cloud um, whether it's emailing or Teams or w w whatever software you know we use, um, time entry very important, um, and uh, uh, yeah, the, all, all the all the kind of programs we use are all um, uh, e based, and so that hasn't really been a big challenge for us, and uh, to be honest. Um, we start Ed and I started working together in New York. And so we were together, um, as I was describing before about getting that, you know, the different influences on and, and thinking on cases. I've now spent uh, spending more time in, in London than I was. Uh, and we're, we're speaking daily three times a day. Uh, it's, it, we, we just, uh, are communicating a lot. And then perhaps that's the answer to your question is that, it's through effective communication, uh, everyone uh, feeling part of a team, not just um, not just always doing casework, but making sure we have uh, social events as well, um, which uh, keeps us all feeling connected and part of a team. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a number of those factors, but it hasn't honestly hasn't really been that big a challenge for us. Thank you. And actually, we've had we've had Aiden over in Australia, so you know uh, we've been using the time zone arbitrage. Uh, Aiden went out to get admitted and got stuck, so to speak, with the with the whole lockdown. Uh, and we've been using the time zone arbitrage of working during the day here, and then passing it over to Aiden to keep working on it through our night, and then waking up to a nice glossy, you know, finished draft in the morning to send off to the clients. Good fun. <laughs> <laughs> Good fun, except when I uh, kind of forget you're in Australia and it's, um, <laughs> you know, the time is getting a bit late at night and I'm, I'm sitting yeah, there as, as though it's 10 in the morning. 11.30 p.m. <laughs> well, we've got a drink social of a Friday evening and it's actually something like 5.30 in the morning for you. I'm not sure if that one works out too well for you there either, but... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, oh, does anyone else have any other questions? We got another one from Dan. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so my question was sort of about the um, virtual work experience now. So, you know, um, what sort of things would we be doing? What's expected of us? Uh, sort of time, time windows for us. So I know we'd be starting work later or in the evening here. What time would we be finishing that kind of thing? Just curious about that. Shannon, do you want to take this one? I can take this one. Um, so the virtual work experience is going to be running from sort of 9.30 till 4.30 London time, which Aidan, I believe that's, what time is that? Yeah. To 1.30 a.m. Yeah. So it's, it's quite a, a late one, but it's not going to be horrifically demanding for you. Um, We've kind of got some nice reading for you to do to get you up to date with the things that we do. So we've, you know, you won't be up sort of running around, trying and find places to print things and post things and do all those sorts of things. Um, so it, it, it's going to be late, but it should be okay for you guys. Um, we've got some drafting tasks for you to do. We've got some advices for you to write. So we've taken um, one of our actual cases that we dealt with where we dealt with an off hire um, claim and a demurrage claim 
and we're going to give you the reading so you know what those things are to start with um, because I know myself I did a maritime law masters and I still get given these advices and go oh my goodness I need the textbook to run me back through those points so you'll get those and then I'm going to give you all of the documents and you're going to be able to write me an advice really similar to the work that I've been doing during my training what Aidan's been doing since he started so it's going to be things like that um, we also have some fun things as well, so some seminars where you'll get to hear from Damon Thompson, who's a partner in the London office. He's uh, our LNG expert, and he's going to give you a rundown of the LNG industry. Um, Callum Chain, our associate, is going to give you a chat about um, energy and law. Um, and then we've got various other seminars, sort of really informal chats with the guys over in America about the New York bar. Um, and about American law school. So it's, it's going to be a bit of everything. And hopefully it won't be, you know, too much for you guys because I completely understand that the time difference is going to be hard work, but it will be worth it. I can ensure you of that. Um, we've worked very hard on the program. Myself, Aidan, Callum, and the rest of the team have been up recording videos for you to watch and things like that. So hopefully that answers your question and keeps you interested despite how late it might keep you up. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Um, I think I think it's going to be good. Uh, give you an opportunity to have some um, some interaction with the firm. Uh, of course, it'd be uh, ideal to have um, everyone in an actual office with us. Um, but short of that, uh, I think this is the next best thing. Uh, and as I say, it's it's a way of establishing a relationship with the firm and, and seeing how they work. And and Shannon's right. We've we've just kept working and business has been in a way business as usual for us even though we're working from home locations and uh the program is set up in a way where if you were to work with us as a if it was an, an english um situation an english trainee or um uh if it was a legal practitioner through our australian entity um wherever you you, you take your qualification um, for those first year or two, it's going to be the kind of work that you you would do. You would start with, you know, get given a fact pattern, get some, given some documents. Can you turn around this research? Can you try and tailor that into an advice? Uh, having done the research now, turn it into a, um, a piece of writing that we would actually send to the clients and uh, get feedback and work on it. And yeah, so. Uh, I hope, I hope it's um, interesting. It's the first time we're, we're doing this whole virtual program uh, rather than a, an, an in-office kind of program. So, yeah. And what are the dates again, Shannon? I think we're going 13th of August to the... Hang on. No, 3rd of August to the 13th of August. 14th. Around that. I've sent everyone the dates, so... Um, it's two weeks beginning of August. That's right, isn't it, Aidan? Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So you got, I think um, most of you guys have submitted your applications already anyway. So I've got those and I am reading them and they are all great. So we'll be in touch with you just after the deadline for that one to let you know whether you've been successful or not. And I'll aim to give you guys a little bit of feedback if you're not successful so that you know why and you can adapt however you submitted your applications in the future because i think that's always helpful and i think i think we need to add another um another section to the criteria of selection for that process and that is whether you turned up for this q a session <laughs> <laughs> i have your names <laughs> i know who you are well done <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any other questions we go tegan she hasn't had a question yet yeah, from what I've seen of everyone else's questions, I think I'm probably one of the more green <laughs> law students here. I'm only in my first semester. So I was just wondering whether um, whether you have any advice about how to <laughs> survive this degree, I guess, and get the most out of it. Good question. I, I, I know that feeling very well. Um, at the start of at the start of uni thinking of oh, five years of, of uni, how am I going to get through this kind of thing? Um, 
in hindsight, it kind of flies. <laughs> By the end, I was like, did I really do five years? Wow, that went pretty quickly. I, I had a, an unusual, not unusual, but a, a different approach. I, as I said, I worked a lot through my university, so I didn't have much time. Uh, I had to be really time sensitive, which set me up well for um, for practice because I, having demanding clients or saying, send me this within three hours doesn't worry me. Um, I won't say that's because I did all my assignments that way, but um, I, I certainly had, I certainly had time pressure. <laughs> um, but uh, look, are you, are you doing a, a double degree? No, but I actually transferred from an arts and commerce double degree into a single law degree. So this isn't my first year of uni ever. <laughs> Okay. All right. And so what is that a three year course? Is it or I think it's four. Four years. All right. Four years like a graduate kind of law. Okay. Um yeah. I, one thing I would say is I wouldn't get too hung up on um trying to work if you're not sure exactly what direction you're going to go ultimately, and which is completely fine. I was in the same position where you were, were at your stage. Um, I wouldn't get too hung up on doing electives for a purpose. I, I would do electives that you enjoy. I, I would, you know, th think about doing some subjects that you're looking forward to doing, or you've got an interest in, or um, you like the lecturer. You think that, that that you've heard really good things about a certain lecturer, and you know that it's a it's a buzz doing that class. Um, and I'd be driven by that, honestly. I wouldn't wouldn't think too much about plotting and planning the rest of my my career if I'm just contemplating how to get through and you know get the best out of the course. Uh, and from there, as you go on, if, if that's kind of your approach early on, as you go on by years three and four for you, it'll start to become clearer um, what electives you want to do. You'll talk more with you know the other other students in the in the um, in your cohort, uh, you'll, you'll gravitate towards certain things. There'll be some subjects that have, um, uh, commonality involved in the way that they approach things and different thinking. And you think, okay, yeah, I can see some direction that I, I want to go. And, uh, and, and the other thing you, you could do if you have, um, have time is you could try to line up, um, uh, work experience or paralegaling with local outfits, local firms. If you're interested in private practice, um, that's I, I would certainly recommend doing that, even in if it's a summer um, month here or or there. Uh, when it comes around to um, job prospects and and looking to demonstrate that um, you are interested in practicing in law, law firms will look at whether you've um, you've done some experiences along the way or some paralegaling and and actually seen the inside of a firm. If you're not interested in private practice per se, and you want to look at other areas, I would, I would adopt the same approach. Like if you want to get into NGO space and uh, work in uh, legal for um, an environmental organization or something, I would try and start lining that up and get some experience and offer to do internships and, or write about it. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, in this day and age, which you can do, and it might not be where you're at right now, but in, in due course is you can start to produce content. Like there's no, there's nothing stopping any of you now. If, if you're so minded, I know it sounds funny, but, um, if, if you want to start to get into an area and, um, really become, uh, by the, okay, this is something maybe for three years, three or four, but you really want to show that you're interested in maritime law or you're interested in property law. You could set up a LinkedIn account, which would encourage you all to do anyway, even if you're just watching other, um, other firms and other people and how they work and then start to chime in uh, and offer, you know, I, I read something on this case and I, I'm really interested in that article you wrote. Well, where did you get the authority for that? Or this is my thought on it and start to generate a conversation. Uh, I think out the, you, your generation has grown up with this, um, this network communication effect and it's having a real impact on how uh, firms and businesses and, and um, NGOs communicate with the world. And so if, if you get involved in that side of it, 
you might find that actually I'm quite interested in this. Uh, I, I like this, this aspect of the communication. Uh, and, and that's another way of starting to learn more about um, an area of law. Anyone else have any, this is an open forum. If anyone else wants to ch chime in, Aiden, Shannon, or, or other students, feel free. I have, I have one thing and it's slightly different to Luke's approach there. Cause I think that that is a way of keeping yourself interested outside of your like work work, because I think that's something really important is making sure that you know that you have other things to do. So, you know, yeah. your degree is so important, but make sure you have something else that when you finish all of your reading which might take you hours and hours and hours of your day make sure that on the weekend you've got a sports club that you can go to or even a group of friends that you quiz with or you go to mooting competitions that and it's different in the uk i don't know if you guys have the same thing but we have like mock court and things like that and they're all good things for your cv for starters being on a football team is you know teamwork that's great it to keep you sane during your degree make sure you've got something else to leave when you put your textbooks down you've got somewhere else to go because that's definitely what got me through so that's my big tip there i think aiden i don't know about you what would you say uh my advice would just be from the beginning try and figure out what you like and what you don't like and then like luke said you can build from there um to figure out well what electives should I do? Or do I want to find an elective, like an area of law that I just have not heard of that might be interesting. Um, and then from there, I would also highly recommend doing honours um, because you really get to learn closely with another academic how to write. Um, and that taught me a lot. And then from there, you can create your own content, um, which is a really beneficial skill to have. And it, Really, I mean, it really helped me in this job because that's how I kind of um, got on with Luke and Ed and found his era of maritime law through writing an article type piece. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I, both both great comments, um, uh, Shannon. I couldn't agree more. I, I was um, I played at uh, Bulo Football Club at the soccer club there for I don't know, the better part of ten years, um, which. Still got really good friends involved in the club. Still follow them on Facebook uh, over here uh, and surfing. You know, those were my two outlets and I did a lot of that uh, in between whenever I could, frankly. Um, and, you yeah, know, hanging out with friends. So it, it's important. It's, it's really important because law is, um, it's taxing. It's, it, it's I, I find it stimulating, um, but it's it's hard hard going. So you got to have some outlet, you have some kind of way to blow some steam. And certainly, if you're staring down four years, it's it's good to have some other things going on. And totally agree with Aiden as well. Okay, that's a good question. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? Sorry, I can't see everyone on my screen. Uh, Brianna. Um, so I was just wondering, I am in my final year heading into my final semester um, and I've been applying for, you know, jobs galore, but because of COVID, everything essentially is being shut down or cancelled. Um, so I was wondering if you have any ideas on avenues to get into private practice um, when everything's kind of been closing down and for grads, that's kind of one of your main ways in. Uh, and when you're talking about things closing down, um, so, you're, think, I mean, you're thinking about like um, summer clerkship programs and... Um, yeah, so grad programs, um, they've all, like a lot of them have been cancelled. I've got one interview out of three that I was shortlisted for because they cancelled their programs. So it's hard mm -hmm. to figure out how you're going to begin when there's no access because of the pandemic. Yeah. And have, have you kind of centered in on, on what type of firm or, or type of work that you'd like to do? Um, ideally I want to be doing, um, international trade. Okay. Um, so I've been looking at, um, firms based in Australia. So like Bird and Bird, um, Ashurst, things like that, Baker McKenzie. 
um, but that the clerk ships are they've just the application deadline has just finished, so I won't hear about them. Um, but yeah, so I'm I've got an interview at Hunt and Hunt. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that's not something necessarily that they focus on, um, but I know it's still they still do trade and they still do things like that that I can kind of find my way into. Yeah, um, it is. It's a tricky time. It really is. I think for a lot of firms, they're still working out what their own plans are, um, particularly in the in the bigger firms because they have such a um, high exposure to. Uh, corporate work often um and that whole sector has just um uh been devastated as as many parts you know of the economy and and, and people are, are affected by this terrible virus uh and so for for a lot of firms it's it's a case of stepping back uh, not making more commitments um and uh waiting to see i i would Number one, I would persist. I would try to find ways to um, generate contact with firms that may be outside of the formal process. I would approach individuals. Um, I would uh, see whether it, whether they might offer something short of the formal program, whether you could come in for a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there, um, even on a, a non-paid basis. Um, I would uh, I would expand my um, broaden my horizons a little bit. I would look at other firms. Perhaps I know you're quite focused on that area, but I would look at other firms to try and get some traction with. Have you done Have you done many work experiences before? Um, I've done two. I did a work experience in the district court in Wollongong, um, but that focused on criminal law. And then I've done my internship, which although is mandatory. Um, was you know another form of work experience which focused on it was a general practice firm right okay uh yeah so i would try and find something else and um it, not necessarily uh, be looking at the international trade um, sector i think of things a little broader than that maybe more international maybe a smaller firm um, maybe a small office of a large firm uh, that's another place to to target and then what you want to try and do is you want to um, pitch something that would be of service to them and helpful to them, but not cost them much money. And I, one idea that just came to me now, um, it's actually kind of builds a bit on how Aiden, Aiden, we started working together is to go to, go to a few firms and say, look, I'm really keen. I want to get into this area of law. I'm looking for a job. I know it, um, it's at the moment firms are still working out, um, you know, their priorities and what the commitments and everything else. But I, I would be very interested to help write your, um, or help produce content, um, uh, and articles and journal articles and help, help you, um, you know, write, yeah, write, write articles basically on different areas of law, um, and see, see whether that gets any traction because what you're trying to do is you're trying to generate a relationship. You're trying to establish, um, a connection with a, a firm, a few firms, and that that could be a way of opening the door and starting things going. And then through that, you, you demonstrate your your interest and how you how well you write and deliver a good service and, and deliver some value. They may say, "Oh no, we've already got people who do that." That's what our trainees are doing at the moment because they don't. Have, or that's what our juniors are doing at the moment because they don't have much other work to do. But that's something I would offer. The other idea comes back to what um, we were talking about with, with Lucy before, and that is um, sizing up the market and saying, you know what, this next year is pretty much going to be a write-off for work um, because those big firms just don't know what they're doing um, in to, uh, as things play out. You know, they're working out their strategies. It's unfolding. It's, it, it is an unfolding situation. I'm better off doing something useful for a year to improve my position. And finding somewhere um, to go and do a one-year course somewhere um, and take yourself effectively out of the job market for a year. Um, Im improve your position. Yes, it might be more of an investment. Um, and that's not, not everyone's able to do that, I appreciate. But I'd, I'd explore that. I'd also explore international options for doing that. Although with COVID, you might 
it might be di more difficult. Maybe there's, maybe you might find that some universities, I don't know the answer to this, but some universities might be offering more distance learning, running some of their programs um, on an online basis, which they weren't previously. And so perhaps there could be some opportunities in there um, where uh, before it may have required having to, you know, move to Stockholm to do a particular course, you might be able to do that um, from from your your um, home office. And then that's that's a way of um, building up your credibility. In, in so when I when I ask you know what what are you interested in, and you say international law, you've got something to then back it up and say, look, I, I took myself out and I did international law at um, this university, did an online course. I've been producing this content. I would write. I would actually um, get active on LinkedIn for that year. I would uh, develop a profile, and so at the end of that year, um, when you put together your application, you can demonstrate to those, particularly those bigger firms, and say, "Look, I've done this. I've done this. I've done that." Um, that's why I'm I'm a better candidate than than others. Okay, hope that answered your question. Thank you, Luke. Uh, do we have time for any more or are we good to carry on? Yeah, okay. I think we'll take a few more questions if that works for everyone else. Um, so who, who wants to go next? <laughs> okay, Dallas? Um, so Aidan just previously said that one of the most uh, memorable and best things that he did during his time at uni was his honours course where he got to learn to write with an academic. Um, was there anything particularly memorable that um, you have done or that you did during university that was particularly helpful or memorable for your career? Um, I, I think the, the thing that I did the most was I, um, I made some great relationships. Um, and I know that sounds, it sounds a bit corny, perhaps, um, but I, I, I wasn't conscious at the time. Um, but I made some really good friends. Uh, I made some, some uh, career contacts. Uh, and I also, I took a different approach. So I, I sized up what would work for me. Um, how I am and, and what I am like and um, was willing to do things a little bit differently. And, and that has really defined the way that I've um, uh, run my career effectively um, and now setting up a firm doing things differently. And so I, there, there wasn't anyone else um, working in Sydney as a paralegal a few times a week and studying in Wollongong catching the train up every day. Um, it, it was full on. Uh, and then, you know, I, I just, I was myself, I, I knew I like working, I've got a strong work ethic and I could see that um, making contacts and demonstrating through actual work that that would, that would take me um, uh, somewhere. And, and it did. So I wasn't afraid to do things my way is what I'm trying to say. Um, and that will be different for everyone. Uh, for some people, that's going to be much more on the academic route. Um, I think, fair to say, I think Aiden's uh, Aiden was on that path, um, and you know, got top marks right at the top of his class in probably everything, just about. Um, and uh, that was the approach that that he took, and he, he took a lot of put a lot of attention into into the studies. And so there's no there's no right or wrong way to to do it. Um, I think it's what's important is to size up what works for you. But when I look back at university and think about what is it that, that, um, that I did, I, I also made the decision to leave science behind early on and go into do politics um, and law. And I enjoy politics, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, and, and so that was a real out, outlet for me. I could go over into the politics class and argue about certain things. Um, I just enjoyed it. I, half my um, BA was philosophy. The other half was uh, was politics and I enjoyed both of those. So I had some subjects that I really enjoyed um, in a way. I enjoyed law as well. Not all of the subjects I did in law, but um, I, I did enjoy the, the logical thinking, the rationality of law. Um, 
And so, yeah, those, those are the kinds of things that come to mind. Okay, any other questions? Any final questions that we've got here? Or Lucy, if this could be the final one, that'd be good. Thank you. Um, just a quick one. This might be an inappropriate question since um, you mentioned that many of the people have already applied for the work experience program, but I was just wondering if there was anything specifically that you were looking for in a candidate? Um, yeah, look, I think uh, most importantly, you want to demonstrate that you've thought about it. Um, and you, you've given you've given some thought to the firm, what they do, um, and why you're interested in doing doing the experience, and what you think you might get from it. You know, and, and that comes through in content, in actually what you write, but it also comes through in how you write and how you present. So you you, you want whatever you send to anyone. And I know if you're applying to multiple firms, it it takes a lot of time, but you want whatever you send to send a good first impression. You know, no, no typos, well laid out, formatted well, um, you know, give it four or five edits, make sure it's crisp. Uh, it's really, really important because it, someone will uh, look at what you produce and take that initial impression in, a, in the first few sentences and how it's written. And that's, that's super important as well as, as I say, a bit of personality, a bit of interest, a bit of, um, you know, something that's going to make for interesting reading. And that's, that's the kind of advice I'll give, not just for the program that we've developed, but for any kind of job application or any uh, application you're making, uh, you want to you be hitting on those tones. And, and as I say, really think about that particular firm, because if you're not showing and demonstrating you've thought about that role and that you're really going for that role and you really want to work at that firm, you're going to be looked over because there are a lot of others who are doing that. And it takes more time and means more tailoring of applications and the rest of it, but it is what will make the difference. And then you follow that through, not that this is the process for this, this uh, work experience, but you follow that process through into interviews as well. You know? And that, that comes through in the, if you have an interview, you want to really be getting across to them that you have taken the time to prepare. So interviews are pre preparation, preparation, preparation. No, who you're talking about, uh, what they do, why you're interested in them. Um, and it's, it's those, you can just tell, having sat on so many uh, interview panels now, you can just tell those that have prepared and those that haven't. Thank you. Nice. Well, um, can I just say thank you all for, for your time and for your, your really interesting questions. I hope, um, I, I hope this was useful for you. If you do have any follow-ups, um, you know, at some point, feel free to get in touch with any of us. We're, we're, we're quite approachable, happy to uh, answer any, um, any queries and, and uh, hopefully this has been useful for you. <laughs>